And now, the Mole Mystery Theater. Good evening. This is Jeffrey Barnes welcoming you to the Mole Mystery Theater, the program that presents the best in mystery and detective fiction. Tonight's play by William Irish is entitled Two Men in a Furnished Room. John Payne, well-known movie personality, will play the leading role of Red Carr. What would you do if a friend of yours were accused of committing murder and circumstantial evidence makes him appear to be guilty? He swears to you that he did not commit the crime, but says that unless you protect him by lying about his whereabouts, he will be unable to prove his innocence. What would you do? That is the problem posed by William Irish in Two Men in a Furnished Room. And now for tonight's Mole Mystery, William Irish's Two Men in a Furnished Room, starring John Payne. Well, you see, Sergeant, I never felt right about Dixon since the first time I met him. I only met him because of the housing shortage. Dixon and I came for the furnished room just about the same time. First, we argued about who should get it, and we ended up sharing it. We got along, I guess. We even became kind of friends in those three months, but just the same, I got a little sore when he started talking about his girl again. I don't get you, Red. You never even met Estelle and yet you're down on her. I don't need to meet her. I know women, that's all. All right, some gal gave you the business. That doesn't mean... Yeah, I know, I know. Doesn't mean anything. Have it your own way. Estelle's different. If it weren't for a mother. (laughs) Yeah, I know. My girl had a mother, too. I never met her, but... uh... You think every gal's out for what she can get? Yeah. But I'm telling you, Estelle... Oh, let's give it up. I want to read. Well, Red, uh... That's, uh... That's what I want to talk to you about. What? Reading? No, uh, not exactly, uh... You see, Estelle called me at the office today, and, uh... Yeah? So? Well, she's got something in her mind, and she wants to come over and talk to me about it. Well, why don't you go over to her place and talk? Oh, you know her mother objects. Yeah, that sounds familiar. So you want me to take a walk? Yeah, if you don't mind. It's raining out. I know, I hate to ask this. And I don't feel like seeing a movie. It won't happen again, Red. Oh, sure, sure. Honest, Red. Oh, what time is curfew? Well, it's almost half past eight now. She ought to be here soon. Okay, I'll clear out now. Oh, now, look, you don't have to dodge meeting her. I don't take this personal, Dix, but I don't particularly want to meet her, okay? I'll just get my coat. You sure you don't mind? Hmm, what's the difference? Oh, I feel like a heel red. Oh, forget it. Maybe someday you can do me a favor. I'll be back around midnight. That's the way it is when you share a room with another guy. You gotta live and let live. Huh. That's a funny thing to say. Live and let live. Especially the way things turned out. The rain was cold and nasty. I crossed the street heading toward the bar on the corner when I saw the girl. She was on the opposite side of the street, head down in the rain. When she got under a street lamp, I could see she was wearing a green raincoat, and I could make out what she looked like. She turned into the house. I stood there looking at the empty doorway for a while and getting real sore. On account of her, on account of her, I had to slop around in the rain. I had a good mind to go back and, uh, well, what's the use? I went to the bar. Yeah. Sort of wet night out. Good weather for ducks. Yeah, ducks. You look mad. Fight with your girl? No, no, not like that. You look like you'd like to kill someone. Yeah? Now give me a shot of rye. All I've got to kill is three hours' time. It was a long three hours sitting there and making small talk, but finally I decided I might as well go back to the room. When I got up there, I knocked on the door. The door opened just a few inches. Dixon was looking out defensively. That you, Red? 
Well, who else did you think it would be, Lana Turner? Come on, open up. What'd you knock for? You've got a key. What's eating you? Why shouldn't I knock? Girlfriend gone, I see. Yeah, just, just a few minutes before you got out of here. You're some guy. You let her go out alone on a night like this? I put her in a taxi. You didn't get wet. It was right at the door. Didn't even get your shoes wet. Okay, okay, I didn't get my shoes wet. What's it to you? Nothing, nothing. What are you so nervous about? Can't you sit still at all? You leave me alone, Red. Sure, sure. What happened? Have a blow-up? Why should we have a blow-up? I don't know. Hey, what's this on the floor? What? This? Looks like a fastener from a raincoat. A green raincoat. Give me that. Okay, okay, don't grab. Boy, you're really all hopped up tonight. Say, where are you going? Down the corner a minute. I want to drink. Since when do you drink at this hour? Since now. Well, take your key. I'm going to bed. I'm coming right back. So long. I didn't get it. I was usually the excitable guy, and here was Dixon acting as if there were a high-tension wire running through him. I undressed, washed, took a grand look at myself in the mirror, and then got into bed. Just as I was getting set to drop off, the phone rang. Hello. I want to speak to my daughter. Huh? She promised to have a definite understanding with once and for all. But listen, and lady, I... you think you'll get anywhere by keeping her there till the hours of the night. I'm telling you, lady... What? Oh, this is Mr. Dixon, isn't it? No, no, this is his roommate. Dixon's out. Well, then I suppose my daughter's left, too. She left half hour ago. Half hour ago? Then why isn't she back here by now? Oh, she'll probably get back any minute. But it's only six blocks. What could have happened to her? It took me a little while to get back to sleep, but after a bit of tossing around, I made it. Only it didn't last very long. <sighs> Hello. Is that Mr. Dixon? No, no, this is still his roommate. I want to speak to Mr. Dixon right away. In just a second, I want to turn on the light. He isn't here. But it's after three o'clock. Well, isn't she back yet? My daughter, no, she isn't. What's he done with her? Where is she? Well, I don't know. Maybe they... I warned her about him. I'm going to call the police. Uh, well, wait a second. That's all. I'm going to call the police. Wait a second. Wait, I hear him coming. Hello, hello. Hello. Ah... Red, you still up? What does it look like? Shut the door. You phoning someone? No, someone was calling you. Me? Who? Your girl's mother. Is Michaels? What does she want? Your girl never got home, Dix. She what? You heard me. She never got home. Oh, but that's impossible. She lives only six blocks from here, but her mother says she never made those six blocks. Now listen, Red. She phoned twice. She said she's going to call the cops. The cops? But why? Do you need a diagram? It doesn't take three hours to make six blocks in a taxi. If she left in a taxi. Are you sure you put her in a cab? Well, uh, to tell you the truth, Red, I I didn't take her down to the door myself. You told me you took her down and put her in a cab. Yeah, yeah, I know. But, well, we, we had an argument and she walked out on me. I was ashamed to tell you, Red. Go on. I heard a whistling from the doorway downstairs. I heard it playing, and I heard a cab drive up. Did you see her get into it? Well, I got over to the window just a second too late. I saw her arm pulling the door catch. That's not much of a story. Hey, who could that be? I wouldn't be surprised if that's the cops. Cops. Now, look, Red, you got to stick by me. Why? Red, don't you see? Outside of me, no one saw her leave here. She ends here. If anything happened to her... Just a minute. Open up in there. Now, Red, you got to tell him you saw her getting into that cab. But I didn't. But you would have if you'd come along just ten minutes before. I swear, I swear it on my mother. Red. Red, what are you going to do? What do you expect me to do? I'm going to open the door. As the curtain falls on Act One of tonight's Mole mystery, it looks as though Dixon is in a tough spot unless his friend Red helps him out. And now this is Jeffrey Barnes returning you to the second act of Two Men in a Furnished Room, starring John Payne.
Well, Sergeant, the first cop that night the girl disappeared was only a curtain raiser. Dixon told his story about seeing her get in the cab. The cop only asked me if I was there. I said no and let her go at that for the time being. That was a curtain raiser. The show really got started the next afternoon when I came back from my job in the bank and found a big guy with his hat on sitting in our easy chair pretending to read a newspaper. It was you, of course. Hey. Well, shut the door. Who are you? Sergeant Hiller, homicide. Surprised? No. No, not surprised. Then shut the door. How'd you get in? Super let me in. You car fellow lives here with Dixon? Mm-hmm, that's me. A girl named Estelle Michaels came here last night, didn't she? Okay, if I sit down, I'm, I'm tired. Go ahead. Well? There was a girl here last night. I think her name was Michaels. Did you see her come in? I think so. From across the street, about 8.30. What time did you get back here? Close to 12. Was the girl still here then? No, no. She just left. How do you know? Did you see her or did your uh, friend tell you? Well, I as good as saw her leave. What do you mean by that? Well, as I came back here, I saw someone getting into a taxi and I saw Dixon at the window looking down. When I got upstairs, he told me she just left. Draw your own conclusions. Had you ever seen this girl before? No, just earlier last night. All right. That's all for now. Stick close by and make sure your friend does, too. I want to see you guys again. After you left, I felt sort of weak, Sergeant. I, I was getting involved in this mess to protect Dixon, and why should I? How did I know he was telling the truth? How did I know they wouldn't pull me in as an accessory if his story blew up? I was building up a good deal of resentment against Dixon when he came home, and then <laughs> I couldn't help feeling a little sorry for the guy. Hi, Red. You want in here? Yeah, a cop named Hiller. What happened to you? Oh, they had me down at headquarters all afternoon. I thought they were never going to let me go. Why shouldn't they let you go? In their minds, I'm already guilty. Of what? Whatever it is, I'm guilty. I had to admit I quarreled with her and... Red, don't you see? I was the last person on earth to see her leave this place. Listen, you got to call up. Who? Her mother. It's only natural you should call her up and say you're worried about the girl. No, no, Red, I can't. What's the number? I can't, Red. What's the number? It's... It's Chelsea 35099. Listen, Red, I can't talk... You've got to, don't you understand? You want me to believe your story, don't you? Yeah, but... Well, then talk to her. Stop acting guilty. Hello? Mrs. Michaels, please. Who is this Watson? Tell her Dixon wants to speak to her. Here, take it. Hello? Hello, Miss Michaels. This is John Dixon. What do you want? I, I just wanted to find out... Where's my daughter? What have you done with her? But, Mrs. Michaels, I, I swear I... I killed her. I can't talk Here, give me the phone. Mrs. Michaels, this is Mr. Dixon's roommate. Murder! 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 I'm getting out of here. I gotta get out. They're going to get me for this for sure. You run away and you're cooked. Then they'll know you did it. I didn't do it, Red. Don't you believe me? I don't know. You know me, Red. Do you think I'm the kind of a guy who killed someone? What do I know? Sure, I've lived in this room with you for three months, but what do I know about you? I didn't do it, Red. Remember that raincoat fastener I found last night? Came from her raincoat. How come? I told you. We, we, we had an argument. She wanted to leave, and I was trying to hold her back. I was holding on to her raincoat, and... Red, don't you see how this thing looks for me? Yeah, I see. Maybe you better clear out. Look, can, can you lend me some dough? I'm dead broke. Well, I can lend you 20 here. I'll pay you back. Yeah? How? Thanks, Red. I'll get in touch with you somehow. Where are you going to be? I don't know yet. I'll let you know. Thanks again. 20 bucks and I get thanks. <laughs> Boy, what a sucker. Dixon hadn't gotten out much too soon. I'd hardly had time to put on some coffee and light a cigarette when, Sergeant, you came to the room. Where's Dixon? I don't know. Beat it, I guess. Where'd he go? How should I know? He doesn't tell me everything. You're covering for him. 
Why should I? I'll be a sucker, Red. <laughs> it's funny. What's funny? Nothing. Okay, then, Carl. Let's get going. Where to? Headquarters? No, no, not yet. First, I'm going to take you to the Michaels house. Maybe when you see the girl's mother, that'll make a difference. We rode the six blocks in our headquarters car, I guess it was. It took maybe three, four minutes. But that time I could do plenty of thinking. So at last I was going to meet the girl's mother. And then what? How far could I go in this whole thing? How far could I protect Dixon? The house was one of those apartment houses that was fashionable, say, 25 years ago. The Michael's apartment was dark, almost dingy, with old furniture. And the mother, she looked old and dried up. She was lying in a bed in a room that smelled as if it had been a sick room for years. She's an invalid. Yeah, it's too bad. Mrs. Michaels, this is Dixon's roommate. I'm sorry about everything, Mrs. Michaels. Your, your voice, it sounds familiar. Yeah, I've spoken to you on the phone. Oh, that's right. I keep forgetting. Tell your story, Carm. Do I have to? I think you'd better. Okay. I was coming back home that night when I saw a girl getting into a cab. You say you saw a girl? Yeah, that's right. Just a flash. Like I said, I saw Dixon at the window, looking down to the street. That's all. You saw Estelle getting into the taxi. I saw a girl. I guess it was your daughter, ma'am. Now listen, Carl. Think carefully. You were close enough to see the girl getting into the cab. Now she must have hailed it, right? Right? All right. Did you hear a shout or a whistle? Well, and now that you mention it... Well? I did hear her whistle. You liar. What? You liar. You didn't hear her whistle. But I'm sure... She that... couldn't whistle. She never whistled in her life. You didn't see my daughter leave that house. When we got in the street, Sergeant, you turned on me. You knew you had me then. Well, Carm, what do you say now? All right, he was lying to me. Still want to cover for him? Listen, leave me alone, can't you? He didn't leave her alone, Carl. We found the body. It's pretty. Want to come down to the morgue, have a look at it? No, no. He strangled her, Carm, and he dragged her up to the roof. He went to the trouble to carry the body across a couple of roofs. You know he isn't very strong. You make two of them, but he carried the girl's body across a couple of roofs and then threw it down an air shaft. Want to take a trip to the morgue car? You let me go then. And I went back to the room feeling sort of sick all the way. When I got back to the room, the phone was ringing. Hello. Who is this, please? What do you want? Who is talking, please? What number do you want? Red. Dixon. Don't use my name. Is anyone there? No. Where are you? How are things going? I got news for you. Where can I reach you? you better tell me on the phone. No, I've got to see you. Where are you? Well... I can't tell you over the phone. All right. I'm at 619 East 10th Street, third floor rear. And Red, make sure no one follows you. Don't worry. I'll come along. <laughs> Well, Sergeant, what I planned to do wasn't very pleasant. It was the only way I could save my skin. And just because he'd room with me for three months, that didn't mean I had to have any sense of loyalty to the guy or something like that. I was in this deep. Now I had to get out. Red, did you want power? I made sure. Good. Just a second. Boy, it's good to see you, Red. What's been happening? I found the girl... They found her. At the bottom of an air shaft, dead. Dead? Oh, what did you think? Red, I... I was in love with her, Red. What did she say to you? What did she do that made you go off your nut? I didn't kill her, Red. I couldn't kill anyone. I couldn't kill her. They didn't even have me in the army, Red. And why were you so careful about opening the door last night? I don't know. I, I 
just had so much on my mind. You told me you'd put her in a taxi. But I admitted that was a lie. You know why I said that. You told me you heard her whistling for a cab. You let me lie to the cops about it. She did whistle for a cab. Her mother says she couldn't whistle. What? You heard me. She couldn't whistle. I didn't know that. I swear I didn't know that. Yeah, isn't that too bad? But I tell you, I heard someone whistle. <laughs> Maybe it was a bird. And I saw someone get in a cab. Sure, sure, I know. Okay, Dix, let's drop the act. I'm going to call the cops. No, Red, you can't. I won't let you. Put down that phone, Red. Hey. Where'd you get the gun? Pawn shop. On my dough. Why, you dirt. You're not going to call the cops, Red. Not even if I have to kill you. I'm not going to let them get me for something I didn't do. Stand still, Red. Don't move. Give me that gun. No. No. Give me that gun, Red! Give me it! Hello, operator. Give me the police. Police, my name is Wesley Carr. I'm at 619 East 10th Street, third floor. Rear. I just had to shoot someone. The guy who killed that girl last night. This is Jeffrey Barnes again. In just a moment, we'll bring you Act Three of Two Men in a Furnished Room, starring John Payne. Well, that's the whole story, Sarge. It was him or me, and I, I didn't want to shoot him. I know, Carr. We just got a report from the hospital. Nixon died in the ambulance on the way over. Oh? Oh, maybe it's better that way. Think so? I don't know. Maybe it is. I'm sorry for him. You know, I tried to cover for him. I, I thought maybe he was innocent until that business about the whistling. Yeah, I should have. I won't get into any trouble about that, will I? About that? No, we're willing to forget then. Oh, thanks, thanks. Can I, uh, can I go now? Uh, just a moment, Carr. Uh, Stevens! Yes, sir? Bring in the girl. A girl? But she's dead. I know. There she is, sir. Sit down, miss. I don't get this. That's not Estelle. Did you ever see this girl before, Carl? I know. I don't know her. Did you ever see him, miss? No, never. Where were you at midnight last night? But I told you. Tell me again. I want him to hear I was in front of the house where that girl was killed. Yeah, and what did you do? I whistled for a cab. And it came and you got into it? That's right. All right, that's all. Stevens, take her outside. Yes, sir. You mean Dixon was telling the truth? That's right, Carl. Then the girl, Estelle. Dixon thought he saw Estelle get into that cab, but it wasn't her. Someone was waiting for her on the stairs, a guy she'd met while she was a canteen hostess. A guy she got tired of when he was overseas. A guy who hated her for throwing him over. Oh? Well, uh, how did you find out all that? Oh, just legwork, Rick. Just, just legwork. Well, uh, <clears throat> yeah. who was the guy? Well, it was a guy I recognized earlier that night. He was killed. Who was it? He was big, strong. Strong enough to strangle him. Carry across a couple of roofs. Who was it? And throw it down an air shaft. Who was it? Drop it, Red. You know as well as I do. It was you. This is Jeffrey Barnes, bringing down the final curtain on tonight's Mystery Theater performance of Two Men in a Furnished Room. The original music for the Mystery Theater is composed and conducted by Alexander Semler. Tonight's play was adapted for radio by Paul Monash. John Payne was starred, Bill Cuddles Quinn and Ralph Bell featured. <laughs>
And now this is Dan Seymour saying good night. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.